Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the Christian greeting. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Please stand for the call to worship. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Our hymn of praise is for all that dwell below the sky. I forgot, we've never done this one here. It's an old favorite, so I will play it through. We have not followed in the way of peace, and we have 
have not honored all that is true and good. Let us conclude our prayer of confession together. We have been foolish and immature people who resist the holy wisdom you graciously offer. Forgive us our sins, O oh God, and lead us to sincere repentance. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Hear the good news. Christ offers himself as bread of life to all who would receive him. This proves his love for us. Scripture is from the Old Testament, Proverbs 9, verses 1 to 6. Again, we'll be reading responsibly. Responsibly, I will read the odd verses and you will read the even. Let us read the word of the Lord. Wisdom has built her house. She has set up its seven pillars. She has prepared her meeting and she has She has also set her table. She has sent out her servants and she calls from the highest point of the city. Come, eat my food and drink the wine I have mixed. Our third scripture is from the New Testament, the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 51 to 58. We will be reading this verse in unison. Let us read the word of the Lord together. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. The bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your ancestors ate manna and died, but whoever feeds on this bread will live forever. Descend some of our scripture reading. Our 
epistle today is from Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every top opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always give, giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. this sermon, I thought, what can I call it? And I came up with the title, Living Assistance Training. In other words, I sort of thought Paul's advice was helping us on how to live our lives, and that might be a good title, that we all need training in how to live well. But according to the 
19, I mean 2021 uh, Highway Safety Patrol Administration. 43,000 people died in traffic accidents that year. Tens of thousands of people still die annually in on, on our highways. In the three states that are the top states, the deaths, we live in one of them. Florida, Texas, and California. We have reduced, have the lead in nation's fatalities. But I think all of us who drive can agree to that. <laughs> I know sometimes I think, how did I get by without an accident that day? Because it seems like no one stops, no one puts signals on. It's frustrating. But more alarming, however, is that many of these crashes are tied to human error. Well, that's why the new cars rolling off the assembly line today are equipped with driver assistant technology. Uh, my car doesn't have as much as some of them, but when I sit in my girlfriend's car, I'll say, what's that noise? What's that? What's that? Because uh, there's always something seems like it's going off. Well, it turns out she likes to stay over on the side of the road, so her car makes noises all the time when she goes over where she should go. And that's some of the things. Um, the new cars are equipped with all kinds of driver assistance technology designed to help drivers reduce their driving errors. And here are some of these relatively new technologies. Until I was researching this, I didn't even know some of them existed. My car is not that fancy. Blind spot warning lights and side mirrors. I don't have that. Forward collision automatically emergency braking. I don't have that. Lane departure warning system. I don't have that. Rear cross traffic warnings that alert drivers of potential collisions while in reverse that may be outside the view of the backup camera. I have a backup camera, but not outside other. <coughs> Adaptive cruise control that automatically adjusts the vehicle speed to keep a preset distance between it and the vehicle in front a backup camera, also known as a rear view video system. That's the one thing I have. And then the other thing they've listed I've never even heard of having, automatic high beams. Well, that's a lot of safety things on vehicles. Now you can begin to think of why cars are so expensive. But there's another plus. If you own a car with some of these technologies and you haven't had a speeding ticket or an accident, your insurance gets lowered. So that's the plus side of having some of these things on your car. I know my girlfriend took her car and she says, can't you turn off some of the stuff that's driving me crazy? And they responds, well, you need to improve your driving. <laughs> and then it won't go off. Well, we are headed for a day in which the actual driving of a car will be entirely ceded to computer systems. We will put the car on automatic pilot such as the captain of commercial airlines does. And there's some experimentation being done on the highways with uh, cars and uh, trucks with no driver controlling anything. I find that frightening. I still think people should have some control. But when it comes to safely living, we do not have any surefire way to control our behavior. Even though we know our actions will lead to dire consequences when something sets us off. We can lose all restraint and do foolish, stupid things. And boy, I, I sometimes am very guilty of that with my poor husband. You know, I keep reminding myself he's not responsible for anything he says or does. But after he's done something, like consumed $150 worth of cigarettes in 10 days, I sort of explode. And then I feel so horrible about it. So I'm working on it. Well, now enter Paul. Although the Bible has much to say about how well to live and what to do right, if we look in the book of Proverbs and we look at all the words of Jesus, we have lots of tips on how to live the way God wants us to. And the apostle Paul is unflagging in his attempt to provide living assistance training. And our reading today from Ephesians 
is a case in point. It reads, as does in Ephesians chapter 4 through 6, like a training manual. Here the wise old saint writing while under house arrest in Rome offers sound biblical advice about how to get along in life and at the same time glorify God. The text has four primary warning systems and each one is coupled with a qualifier or contrasting phrase such as be careful, not as, make the most of time because, do not be foolish but do not get drunk, but this is cautionary advice. So let's look closely at each of these living assistance training guidelines. The entire phrase is, be careful then, how you live, not as unwise people, but as wise. When we shout a warning, we might say, mind the gap, watch your head. Watch where you're going. Look out. Watch your step. There is a strong note of having visual awareness in all of these imperative warnings. The New Testament was written in Greek, and Paul uses a word that implies observation. He might as well have said, be mindful, be observant, look out, be watchful. He is stressing the importance absolute vigilance. To what end? To keep from doing a face plant on the sidewalk? Be careful how you live. But the Greek word Paul uses does not mean live, but walk is precipitate. When we watch where we are walking, we are better able to see rocks, pebbles in our path, when we are about to step into a void or off a curb, when we are about to flatten a pile of dog doo-doo, <laughs> when a tree limb is crossing our path, or when there is a path that turns suddenly and has a steep upgrade. The walk can be an enjoyable one if we watch our steps. This kind of circumspective living is not something that the foolish are fond of. Fools, the Greek word is asaphal, meaning without wisdom, often lacks critical thinking, frequently demonstrates poor judgment, and are astonishingly unwilling to learn from experience or to take instruction. In other words, dumber than a barrel of rocks. Know any people like that? People who do not watch where they are going seem unable to anticipate consequences. Being impulsive, they tend to make hasty decisions driven by immediate desires or emotions rather than thoughtful reflection. This impulsiveness can lead to a series of ill-advised choices that may have long-lasting percussions. Those benighted souls who do not watch their steps also tend to resist new information or alternative perspectives. Foolish folks are pigheaded and abhorrent, clinging stubbornly to their beliefs and opinions, even in the face of overwhelming evidence to the contrary. This intellectual inflexibility can hinder personal growth and prevent them from adopting to changing circumstances. They ignore advice or dismiss the expert of expertise of others, further isolating themselves from valuable insights that could contribute to better decision making. Another trait making those whom the Apostle Paul calls foolish is an appalling lack of self-awareness. Fools fail to recognize their blind spots. They overestimate their abilities and inhibit a sense of arrogance that blinds them to the need of self-improvement. Of course, one needs a balance between being overly cautious and wildly reckless. 
But if we need a living assistant idea, the apostle is on to something here. Be careful then how you live. Not as unwise people, but as wise. Carpe diem. The word Paul chooses is not time in the sense of chronological or linear time, but rather specific moments in time, as in opportunities, occasions, the here and now. This is the second living assist warning he gives. No time like the present. Why? Because the days are evil. What does he mean? it was quite possible that Christians experienced cultural hostility, if not physical abuse, and sometimes incarceration, even death. Paul himself, as he was writing this, was under a house arrest in Rome. Paul might be saying that because Christians were so often detained, distracted, or distraught, it was imperative that time be spent wisely or judiciously. That is, the Ephesian Christians should be alert for every opportunity to do good, to make a difference. That is living wisely. Why get all upset about evil? How, why get all set about how evil the world is treating you? Why waste all that energy worrying about it? Why get murdered? in negative despair of how the country is going to hell in a handbasket when you could be volunteering at church, the community center, or in a hospital. A wise use of time does not involve tilting at windmills, flogging a dead horse, or closing the barn after the horse is out. Christians who make the most of the time have a good understanding of the temporal nature of life. Opportunity does not waste time with those who are distracted and caught up with the pointless endeavors. The third living assist reminds us not to be distracted while driving down the road. It is foolish to text and drive. Dangerous to be talking on the phone while driving. Hazardous to reach in the back seat for a can of soda while driving. Some of these behaviors are so foolish, they're illegal. Using this metaphor, the verse could be written, don't drive foolishly, but always remember what the law requires. People who live wisely understand the will of God. You say, I don't know what the will of God is for me. Nonsense. Of course you do. You know that taking credit for work you did not do is not God's will. You know that sneaking around with someone outside of a covenant of marriage is not the will of God. Actually, the Apostle Paul addresses this issue in his letter to the Galatians. Be led by the Spirit, he writes. This is the will of God when push comes to shove. On the other hand, the works of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, sorcery, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, fractions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like that. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Yes, we know what God's will is. And if we are driving our lives safely, we will not ignore the law. Paul goes on to contrast foolish drivers with wise ones. Those who demonstrate love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Then he adds, and there's no law against those things. Finally, we may not have thought about this, but the last living assist is about drunk driving. 
Wise Christians do not drink and drive, figuratively or literally. People who get drunk with wine embarrass themselves and others. Their behavior is cringeworthy. Christians should not do this. Foolish Christians do, but not the smart ones, not the ones who are making the most of life, who are careful how they live. Too often, we hear media reports about professing Christians who have totally embarrassed themselves, thereby making it a lot more difficult for the rest of us. Paul says, in effect, don't be that person who becomes a laughing stock, an object of diversion, someone who brings dishonor to our faith. Rather than being excessively full of vodka, gin, or whiskey, we should be drunk on the Holy Spirit. When my daughter was in high school, she went to a Episcopal country day school. And you would think a place like that, that had chapel and all these things, everyone would be nice, upstanding young people. Well, drugs were rampant at her school, especially in the upper school. It was a K through 12 in the upper school. And um, Melissa, did not use drugs, but yet she was always jolly and happy. And someone says, what on earth are you on? She said, I'm on the Holy Spirit. And I thought that was pretty good for someone 16, 17 years old to say that. She says, I'm not on any of those drugs. She was often seen with some of these people because she'd sit and talk to them and try to influence them. In other words, she was being a pastor all the way back in high school, you might say, with the kids in her school. But that's what she'd say, I'm on the Holy Spirit. I'm drunk on the Holy Spirit. If we are going to be exuberant Christians, the joy should flow from the Spirit, not from spirits. So let us sing lustily the bar songs of Scripture. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to one another. Singing and making melody to the Lord in your heart. Giving thanks to God the Father at all times. By following the living assist ideas Paul offers, we can ensure that we will be safe and that we will not cause injury to others. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our hymn of response is, Let There Be Peace on Earth. Let us stand and pick up our voices.
He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he comes to judge quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. During our prayers of the people, when I say merciful God, please respond with, hear our prayer. Now I know that's the same response as last week, but it's not the same prayer, which I hope. <laughs> Let us pray. Brothers and sisters, as Christ offered him up for the life of the world, let us pray for the needs of the world, saying, Merciful God, God, we pray for the church in every land. Confirm in the hearts of Jesus' disciples a will to serve you by loving their neighbors and doing good to their enemies. For, cha ca ca for church charities, merciful God, God, we pray for those who lead your church, guide the pastors, elders, deacons, teachers, musicians, and all others who order the life of Christian community and strengthen them to be faithful in their calling and humble in service and those who lead the churches throughout the world. Merciful God, God, we pray for those who govern the nations and exercise authority in civil life. Give our governing officials wisdom in the ways of peace and justice and a determination to pursue the common good. We pray for the rulers of every nation and city. Merciful God, yeah. we pray for the sick, particularly the following. Dale, Louise, Cindy, Nora, Lou, Gail's nephew, Eric and Alan, Lori's sister-in-law, Wendy, Phil Reed and his daughter, Paula. Lou's friend Judy, neighbors Bob and Debbie, nephew Eric, John's niece Mary, Ryan's grandmother, Courtney's friend Titania and Armin, Becky, Gail and Bill, Jack and Jill, Bruce, Lila's sister Elizabeth, Sarah's friend Kelly, Louise's brother Roger, and her daughter Ginger. Merciful God, we also pray for the poor and the oppressed. Help those who are in trouble and stir up in your church a desire to be instruments in the relief of human misery for those in need. Merciful God, God, we pray for our planet Earth. Calm the storm and quiet the rumbling volcano. Give us seasonable weather and tranquil seas. Let earth yield an abundance of fruit for the flourishing of every creature and give humankind the will to use its resources wisely. For God's good earth, merciful God, hear, hear the prayers of your people, merciful God, and grant that what we ask in faith we may receive according to your gracious love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy kingdom, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
victory in the prayer of dedication found in your bulletin. Receive, O oh God, for the fruits of our labor, and with these gifts accept the offerings of our lives. Unite us with Christ, that we may share in his mystery and glorify you. Amen. Our ascending hymn is Be Thou My Vision. grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And for all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.